So welcome everyone, and thanks to our program partner, the University of Saskatchewan MFA in Writing Program, and to Delaine Just for sharing her tips on reading like a writer. This program is coming to you from my home in Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. On behalf of the Saskatoon Public Library, I pay respect to the Indigenous ancestors of this place and affirm our collective commitment to reconciliation. My name is Theresa, and um, feel, free me, feel free to send me a chat message if you're having trouble or have any questions. Um, and we'll mute ourselves while Delaine is presenting. And then feel free to unmute yourself when uh, there's time for discussion. Or if you prefer, you can put your uh, questions and comments in the chat. Uh, with that, I will hand things over to Delaine. Thanks, Theresa. Um, so yep, yeah, I'm, I'm Delaine. Um, I am a, now in my second year of the MFA in writing program uh, at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, I guess a little bit more about me. Uh, I also did, went to the University of Saskatchewan for my undergrad degree, uh, which is where I did a um, English honors degree. Um, it's behind me on the screen there. Um, and so this presentation is kind of a combination of both of those skill sets from what I've been learning um, at the MFA, uh, in the MFA program, as well as my skills that I've also brought from um, my English degree as well. Uh, so reading like a writer kind of puts those two areas that I love kind of together. Um, my primary like writing interests, uh, my thesis project is a short story collection. Um, most of these stories are um, genre bending in some way. Uh, a lot of elements of like uh, fantasy sci-fi mixed with more of like a realistic fiction narrative style. Um, so that's just a little bit about me. Um, and so the presentation, the way I kind of have it set up is there will be like time for all of you to also uh, like work on your own for like brief periods to answer some questions that I'll bring up related to reading like a writer. And then I'll also ask for um, some audience participation as well, which as Teresa said, like you can write that in the chat or if you feel comfortable, you can unmute and answer aloud. Um, I will read the, the chat answers out loud, but I, um, I maybe like won't include the names or just like the first name if, if people are comfortable with that. Um, and with that, I will begin to share my presentation here. Okay. So why you're all here is for the presentation on reading like a writer. So to start, um, what we're gonna really be thinking about is like, what does it mean to read like a writer? Um, so like writers often when they're writing they like everything goes through so much editing and so much like rewriting and rethinking and restructuring um, that the writers like make this writing look so like effortless like when you read it you're like wow that just feels so like it came to them so naturally um and so but like we all know that like really that whole process takes a lot of time and what we're doing by reading like a writer is in a way trying to break down what they did to revise that story into what it became. Um, so we're analyzing each word choice um, sentence um, on like that lower uh, level, like more or more specific level of as, as well as looking at larger plot uh, framing devices and picking out those areas to find out what's working in a piece, um, what's not working um, and using our readings of other material to then apply it to maybe our own writing as well. Um, and also I will note too that usually like when this like reading like a writer stage kind of comes into play is more typically on like a second or later reading of a piece. Um, since when you're actually just reading it for the first time, uh, you really just want to like immerse yourself in the piece. And then what we'll be thinking about is then once you're reflecting on the piece, what are those areas that you would pull out and think about, okay, which one stood out in my brain from that work? So one uh, 
book slash audio book that I highly recommend is uh, Francine Prose's uh, Reading Like a Writer, um, which I named this um, presentation kind of after as well. Um, she, in that book, really breaks down craft choices, um, even on the level of yes, yeah, sentences, paragraphs, um, really breaking down why writers choose that perfect sentence or that perfect um, paragraph, and also like how different writers use those different um, styles as well. So this uh, section I wanted to particularly highlight, um, prose states, I read closely word by word, sentence by sentence, pondering each deceptively minor decision that the writer had made. And though it's impossible to recall every source of inspiration and instruction, I can remember the novels and stories that seem to me revelations, wells of beauty and pleasure that were also textbooks, private lessons in the art of fiction. So that's kind of what we want to be doing here. So with that, what I first want you to think about um, now is um, what was like a recent book that you really enjoyed or your favorite book of all time. And just like take a moment to uh, either close your eyes or just think in your head, um, what part of the story just comes to mind immediately? Is there a particular scene, um, a particular um, emotion? And just hold that in your brain for a second. So then thinking about that scene, um, what emotions is it generating within you? Um, what point in the novel did it appear? Or if you're thinking short stories, what point in the story did it appear? Um, is it closer to the beginning, closer to that middle, like climax moment, or is it towards the end, like in the final last few scenes? Um, so thinking about these questions is what we really mean when we're thinking like a writer. We're thinking about why that placement is so important and how that those scenes will create that lasting memory, and then hopefully how we can create that um, in our own writing as well. Okay, so another um, text that I found particularly helpful was um, Michael Cardos's text, The Art and Craft of Fiction. Um, so I've compiled some of the questions throughout this book that I found the most useful to use when thinking about reading a piece like a writer. Uh, I narrowed down, there were quite a few questions um, in Cardos's book, and if you're interested in all of them, I'd, I'd recommend checking that one out. Um, but uh, I have two slides of questions that I think were the most prominent to me. So you think of that novel and story again, and you might even want to break it out again after this, um, or, and maybe during the rewatching of the recording, and think about these questions and search for those answers again. Um, so for instance, why does the story begin when it does? Um, commonly, the stories will begin at a moment uh, when everything shifts in the main character's life, but that's not always necessarily the case. And so thinking about exactly what moment the story chose to begin on is really important because it is often that beginning chunk that a writer um, would use to eventually sell their book to publishers as well, or also just to hook the reader into the story and the narrative. So another question, oh, that's the one I, I just asked. So closing your eyes, what do you picture most clearly? Um, also, how does the story bring the main character's problem into a sharper focus? Why does the story focus on the main character as opposed to another character in the story? And if the story is told from more than one character's perspective, why do you think that that choice might have been made? So I'll give you a second 
to kind of ponder these first questions. So for me, when thinking about a story that I picture clearly in my mind, um, the one that I thought of as an example was, um, I believe it's called Circe, uh, like by Madeline Miller. Um, that was one I read last year um, during kind of like the initial pandemic uh, shutdown when there was so much time to read, which I miss. Uh, but in that book, uh, when I close my eyes to think about what is it that is coming to mind for me, um, I most vividly remembered this moment um, where she was about to be attacked in her home by a group of sailors that landed on her island. Um, Circe is a, um, a minor goddess, just for a bit of backstory clarification. Um, and this scene was really impactful because um, when she was being attacked or about to be attacked by um, these sailors, uh, there's this moment um, in my visual memory of her backing up towards the wall uh, and this realization that they were going to harm her um, and touching the coolness of the wall on her fingers. Um, and so when I thought about this more, like, so I thought, okay, that's the part that stands out um, quite clearly in my mind. Um, and I was thinking about, okay, like why would that have stuck out so much to me? Um, and what I think I came to realize was that it's because in that moment, that was when the main character, Cersei, lost her faith in humanity and humans and saw their darker, more evil side, whereas before she had a more idealistic view of them. Um, and so now the next step there would be to take that scene and think about, okay, but how did Miller create these images? Like what, how did she instill this emotion within me um, to make this moment so memorable and emotionally impactful? So some more questions here. Oh, it's from Cardos as well. Uh, which parts of the story are dramatized through scenes? Like, for example, the scene I was just talking about, um, if that was summarized, it would have a very different effect. Um, whereas other parts where uh, perhaps the writer wants to cover a large expanse of time um, through a very short space, that's when summary can be used to a quite greater effect. Um, also thinking about what does the overall voice and the point of view do for the story? Um, so even a story that might be in a more common point of view, like for example, third person um, limited, a quite common point of view in a lot of novels. Um, even with that point of view, um, thinking about, okay, but why did the author choose a voice that was both distant and intimate at the same time, a voice that's close to and also removed from the main character? Uh, thinking about, too, how is the story structured? Is there an alternate way that that story could have been structured? Or is this structure in some way representative of the way the story works? Or is it just the best structure for keeping tension throughout the narrative? Another question is, why does the story end where it does? Um, is there a character change that is finally wrapped up at the end of the story? Uh, or does the story make use of repetition from the beginning of the narrative um, to show more of a circular movement? Uh, also, this one is particularly my favorite to think about is what details make the story especially vivid or unexpected? I'm really interested in those like, um, really interesting aspects of the narrative. Um, and sometimes that'll be on like a lower level with thinking about particular sentences and details in like the setting or the way that certain characters will speak. Um, or sometimes it'll be the narrative structure as the whole that make it, um, that give it some kind of unique twist. 
And then finally, thinking about all those questions kind of at the same time is what specific techniques would you most readily take from the story and then try in your own story as well? All right. So now I'll ask for a little bit of, of audience participation. Uh, what I kind of want to do now is using the questions from the previous slides, um, and I have a couple in particular that I'll ask you. Um, so we'll think about this first um, chunk of the Telltale Heart narrative, which um, actually seems rather fitting for the time of the month, uh, time of the year um, that we're doing this workshop. Uh, but I also chose it just because it's quite a common short story that um, quite a few people have read at some point in their lives. But what I want to do now is I'll read out this section from the beginning of the story. And then I'll ask some of you for your thoughts on um, answers to some of those questions. All right, so Telltale Heart. True, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous I had been and am, but why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Park it and observe how healthily how calmly I can tell you the whole story. Okay, so for a little backstory too, for if there are any of you who have not read this story before, um, just like a little bit into where it's going. Um, eventually the main character um, who is haunted by this eye of their neighbor eventually goes quote unquote mad and ends up uh, murdering their neighbor. Um, so this is how the story begins. Um, and, but I'll, I'll turn it now to the question, um, like why might the story begin when it does or where it does? Um, and so if anyone has answers to that, I'd love to hear it in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself. There are no like wrong answers, just whatever comes to mind. So we have one mentioned in the chat saying, we're put immediately into the character's emotional state, 100%. And what might that emotional state be? Um, if you don't mind answering that as well, or if someone else has an answer. A state of anxiety. Mm -hmm. We have another answer saying the conversational questions draw us in like we're sitting right there with him. Yeah, definitely. There, there's this conversational tone and these questions as well, right from those first couple sentences. And why also, oh yeah, we have uh, also someone in the chat saying trying to explain or justify himself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. You can go on if you're. Oh, like, sorry, I didn't even know I had my. <laughs> I, oh, was it's okay. I was unmuted. <laughs> no um, worries. No, that that's exactly as I thought. It his he's it's like he's talking to someone else, but convincing himself of his state as well and mm -hmm. of his posture, and because of the largeness of it all. I mean, talking about I heard 
for all things in heaven and hell. I heard many, th- or heaven and earth and many things in hell, just this enormous hyperbole. You just see, <laughs> he's really uh, trying to convince himself. Totally. And the exactly. reader, yes. <laughs> Yeah, and even I see like some other people in the chat are bringing up a similar kind of thing, like um, with um, uh, there's another person who said that the the I heard many things in hell also is like that question of sanity of the main character. Um, also, uh, this information is being presented as though um, another comment is saying as though the main character is an observer and yet also a participant, creating a sense of detachment. Totally. So on that note as well, like, what does this voice of the main character kind of do for the story itself? Like, what does this perspective um, yield to the story? Or as a additional question in that same vein, uh, why does the story focus on this character as opposed to another character? feel free to also if anyone wants to unmute or in the chat uh, oh yeah there's someone in the chat saying he seems grand in his own mind at least mm-hmm. definitely does create that sense of grandness in himself and in um, his way of speaking but then at the same time there's that sense of justification in the voice as well Um, We also have another person who commented, because this character is interesting, he's sure he's not mad, but he definitely put the question in the reader's mind. 100%. The um, Poe is already starting us with a character that um, doesn't only have a situation in which um, there's like this tension building, but also the character themselves um, has an inner conflict. Um, So there's that outer conflict of the of the murder and them being uh, him being um, questioned by the authorities, um, which is kind of the outer context of um, the story. Uh, but at the same time, this there's this inner turmoil within the character himself. And it also sets the stage with these questions, as mentioned before, these all kind of set the stage of what this story is and how it is going to be told to us. So it almost gives us, the readers, a an answer key for how the story is going to be read. Um, so right from the get-go, it says that um, how calmly I can tell you this whole story. Like we, un- we get that this sense that something very bad has happened. And what will follow is a description of this happening from this um, very unreliable narrative uh, or narrative perspective. Um, And yes, there's another comment here too saying we're thrown in into that conflict with him from the first sentence. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And there's also an opposition between nervousness and calmness at the same time. Yeah, definitely some conflict. Like we see that conflict in how he sees himself and also how he might be acting. Yeah. So then I'll also, I I highlighted a couple other things that I wanted to show. So with Poe in this narrative, um, I've highlighted all of the punctuation in this little section and as you might notice there is a lot of it there's a lot of punctuation here um and it's particularly a unique aspect of this story um 
there's a lot of commas, exclamation points, um, and this kind of happens throughout the narrative. Um, semicolons are used quite frequently as well, um, and it creates this sense of urgency in the voice. Um, starting with true, it kind of like starts right off with this exclamation and then nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous and been an am, but why? And it just kind of keeps going and creates this sense of urgency in the voice itself from that use of punctuation. Um, and that's one of the things that um, I really thought was like quite cool how, how he played around with that. So um, there's semicolons, question marks, commas, every, everything in already just this first paragraph. Then also, I wanted to highlight um, some of these like have already been kind of mentioned, but um, right from this first paragraph, Poe is already giving us clues um, to reveal about the narrator, narrator and the narrative already from this beginning um, paragraph. So the narrator's problem is already revealed. Um, they have a sort of disease, as they say, that sharpened their senses. And now their main objective within this piece is to tell their story, to prove that they are not mad. So as I mentioned before, we, we kind of get this roadmap right from the beginning. Um, so, and then for just some other things that the paragraph's doing, uh, which some of you have also kind of mentioned something along the lines as well. Um, it's engaging readers right from the start. Um, it states that there's a story yet to be told, um, which piques the reader's interest um, right and curiosity right off the bat. Um, and there's that tension in the punctuation um, that sharpness that gives that urgency that the readers find themselves also falling into. So here are some of my primary tips and tricks for things to keep in mind. Um, relating to also those questions as well, but some things to keep in mind when then, if you wanna go back to a favorite book or um, favorite piece, looking closely at the word choice, the sentence length, the punctuation of maybe a particular scene or even that beginning piece um, of a book that you particularly found yourself um, immersed in. Um, which uh, might, it seems almost contrary to what the author wants for you because they want you to feel that immersion uh, or immersion, <laughs> immersion, I, I make up words. Um, they want you to get that immersion into the narrative. But what you're doing when then reading like a writer with that analytical eye is rereading it again and purposely slowing yourself down, looking at the word choice, the sentence length, the punctuation, picking out or underlining if, uh, depending on your comfort level with your own books, I sometimes underline with pencils, so like, because I don't want to use pen, but I, I like to still underline those key areas of um, symbolic language, like metaphor, simile, the parts that particularly stand out. Um, and looking for how as well, like these little bits of information are revealed throughout the piece. So like with Poe's work, um, how already from that first paragraph, there were these little nuggets of information the reader was already being fed. Um, so thinking about how, as I would put it, secrets are revealed within the text or how the narrative hooks um, are revealed and how the author has created that chain linking of events through revealing little bits of information um, a bit at a time. Um, and then further as well, focusing not just on what is said, but how it is said. Um, so back to like that word choice as well is just in what way is it being said, like with the conversational tone that Poe uses. Okay, so so 
now I wanted to do kind of a practical approach to using some of the questions and ideas that we talked about with the beginnings of a couple other works as well. So one book that I particularly thought had a really interesting viewpoint was Emma Donahue's The Room. Um, so we'll go in a little bit blind for any of you who haven't read it before or, or if you have read it before, that's okay too. And you could use what you already know about the book um, here. But we'll read it through a first time. So uh, The Room by Anna, Emma Donahue on page three. Today, I'm five. I was four last night going to sleep in wardrobe. But when I wake up in bed in the dark, I'm changed to five abracadabra. Before that, I was three, then two, then one, then zero. Was I minus numbers? Hmm? Ma does a big stretch. Up in heaven, was I minus one, minus two, minus three? Nah, the numbers didn't start till you zoomed down. Through skylight, you were all sad till I happened in your tummy. Okay, so now I'll give just like a couple of moments for you to read that over again. And the questions that I'm gonna be asking will be kind of back to those original questions about why might the story start here? Um, but also, what are we already learning about this narrative from this section? Where do we think this might be going? And what like little bits of information or secrets are being revealed to us? Like, what do we know about this main character and this setting? So we do have one comment in the chat saying, we immediately get a sense of the narrator's blossoming self-awareness and curiosity. Yeah, we get those that question right at the end of that first paragraph. Um, so we kind of get that expectation that throughout this narrative, um, the protagonist will be um, a very curious um, and and very curious individual who will be asking questions throughout that kind of also help drive the narrative forward and help inform the reader too of what is happening and what is to happen. Uh, but why might uh, Emma Donahue have chosen to use this perspective of Jack in this narrative? Um, we have another comment too that sounds like that says it sounds like such a normal question in a normal situation. Um, yeah, definitely. Like the the one really interesting thing about this piece too is that Jack's voice is very much a child's voice and like a regular child's voice and you get the sense that he is like he's he's a kid he's, he's a kid like any other kid um, and his voice really does create that any other thoughts on the choice of jack as a narrator and this initial uh chunk here We have a uh, statement in the chat that says, I like the way in which the items in the room are capitalized, bed, wardrobe, skylight. It sort of establishes the sense of being in a room. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, we get, um, in a way, this is the character mapping out his um, entire world, um, which is the room. We get capital W, wardrobe, capital B, bed. These are the locations in which he navigates his entire life. Um, Skylight as well. Um, yeah, we get all of these, these capital, almost like how you would name cities and things. Um, another comment in the chat says, this child does not know anything else but the room. That's his world and his perspective is very limited, but he doesn't know it. Mm -hmm. And there's also a comment saying the child's so innocent and like, like, good luck, kid. And, and yeah, that is kind of what the book is about, too, is like later on uh, outside of um, like the child does kind of struggle um, being away from the room. Uh, don't want to spoil too much, so I won't go too far into stuff like that. Um, oh, I haven't seen the movie, but someone mentioned that, too. Um, 
There's another comment saying, I haven't read the book, but saying the character's age not only reveals something about him, but tells how long they've been there. It seems like the reader is going to learn things along with the child as his awareness grows. Yeah, that is like, I think, um, a big aspect of this initial uh, section as well. Right from the get-go, not only is the voice introduced by, um, through this like, uh, like I was four last night going to sleep in wardrobe, but when I wake up in bed, that like grammar mistake there instead of woke up in bed um, kind of reveals that nature of the voice. But also we get the exact age of the child, which sets up who this character is um, in like a small way, but still a significant way that we are being told this, narr this whole narrative from the voice of a child. Um, there's also someone mentioned too that there is tension in that the child sleeps in wardrobe. Yeah, yeah, there's there's definitely tension there too, especially when it mentions wardrobe and bed. Um, that they sleep in the wardrobe, but they also wake up in the bed. Um, so it leads the readers to question why that difference there. Um, we're also already questioning why is wardrobe capitalized? Um, and then we also get the introduction of our secondary main character um, in that second uh, paragraph when the dialogue occurs, um, which is referred to, she's referred to as Ma, I believe the whole story. I think there's like a moment or two when her name is revealed, though I'm at a loss for actually remembering her name at the moment, but um, Jack refers to her as Ma throughout uh, most of the piece. Um, and so we were introduced to Ma as well, and we are immediately put into this um, kind of strange setting where there are these two primary characters, there's the son and the mother, and we're left then as we continue on to learn more about them. Um, there's also that, um, that right at the bottom of what I included here, um, you were all sad till I happened in your tummy. We get a sense that there is something really dark at play here too, with um, a reason the mother is so sad. Um, so in that vein as well, um, there's already these little bits of information, these tidbits being revealed to us very carefully and precisely in this initial section. Any other comments on that one before I move on to the next bit? Okay, so the other one I wanted to look at um, is uh, The Break by Catherine Evermet, who uh, I believe also just released a new novel as well, which I haven't read yet, but um, excited to look into that one too. Um, but this book, um, oh, there's one more comment about uh, the previous one, so I'll just read that out first. Um, by using the point of view of the child, the story can unfold without the jade and hardened view of an adult. Yeah, that's a really important point as well. We get an innocent look at a very dark topic, whereas the jaded adult viewpoint, still a very like interesting viewpoint, but maybe a, for a different story um, than the one that is being told in the room, or for just it would just make it a different type of narrative rather than the one that appeared in the book. Uh, yeah, so The Break by Catherine Ever Met, this is also, I'm kind of doing a trend of doing the opening sections, um, since I think it's easiest if you read the opening sections in case you haven't read the, the books or uh, stories before to get more of a sense of where, they're, where it's starting, um, so you don't need too much background clues yet. Um, but I will read this chunk here. Um, and then we'll discuss it in a similar way as the last one as well. Um, so the break by Catherine of Vermette. In the winter, the break is just a lake of wind and white, a field of cold and biting snow that blows up with the slightest gust. And when snow touches those raw hydro wires, they make this intrusive buzzing sound. It's constant and just quiet enough that you can ignore it. 
like a whisper, you know, is a voice, but you can't hear the words. And even though they are more than three stories high, when it snows, those wires feel close, low, and buzz, a sound that is almost like music, just not as smooth. You can ignore it. It's just white noise, and some people can ignore things like that. Some people hear it, but just get used to it. So I'll give you a second to think about this one as well. Got a minute or so. Which I want you to think about as well is, what are we already being told from this section? Um, what is this setting up? Um, are we getting hints about the setting or the character? Um, we don't, uh, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave it at that. I won't, I won't talk too much more until I give you a second. Okay, so yeah, so what can you take away from this initial paragraph? Like why start us here or more, more a better question would be, um, what do we learn immediately from this chunk at the beginning? And then I'll give a little bit of the, the background as well and and explain a little bit about that for, but I also kind of just want to know initial thoughts. So one person in the chat said, this seems very stark and her use of so many single syllable words adds to that starkness. That's, that's for sure, definitely like the, when it snows, those wires feel close, low buzz, like, yeah, they're very, um, uh, they're kind of like punchy single words, which starts, which gives it that um, kind of like it's talking about there with the music and the buzzing noise. It almost in itself creates, um, there is like a music quality, but also a punchy buzzing quality. Um, another person said it's quite repetitive, even the word ignore is repeated many times. That is also very true, which is an interesting thing because sometimes that's um, a, a very uh, like something we're told not to do is like avoid repetition. But at the same time, it can be used to a great effect when used um, similarly to how uh, Vermette used it here. Sometimes it can create an emphasis on something. Um, we have another comment that says, sound is important to the narrator. There are references to noise, music, buzz, hear, voice. There are long sentences like a phrase of music. Yeah, 100%. Like, I feel like this piece, like when you read it out loud or um, hear it out loud, it, it kind of, you can kind of hear that music to it as well, um, which I think comes from also that use of um, alliteration with um, wind and white. Alliteration is the um, repeated sounds um, at the beginning of words. So wind and white. Um, we also have, uh, uh, do, 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 do. there's also like internal rhyme as well with like the buzz and uh, you get the intrusive buzzing. No, that's too different. Buzzing sound. Mm -mm. Oh, snow touches those. You get a lot of S's there. And I'm saying with like wires, intrusive, buzzing. There's kind of like that, those repeated sounds. Um, another uh, part in the chat says, we can hear the hydro wires. It feels like we're in a remote town. The sound is a disruption to the calmness of the surroundings. Yeah, definitely this feeling of disruption, I think is a key element, not only in this paragraph, but also in the narrative itself. Um, Another person said, wanting to hear music in this cold, isolated landscape. That too, you definitely get that feeling of isolation. Um, and even, even there, it doesn't necessarily say that there's no one around, but you get that feeling of isolation through the lake of wind and white, the field of cold biting snow, those large expanses create that feeling of isolation. Um, yeah, and uh, there's another person in the chat who said, the setting is so easy to conjure in the mind, isolated, love winter in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, that winterness, I think, also brings that isolation feeling. Um, and also that 
uh, it's a voice, but you can't hear the words, like those feelings. Um, another person has, says, the buzz that the narrator can't ignore is perhaps symbolic of the noise in her head, the constant self-talk she can't ignore. That, that's a very interesting um, thought as well. It, it's similar to that, I believe, in um, my own reading of the, the book. I'll, um, I'll read out the summary of the book, too, and maybe that'll help us get an idea, too, of um, where this kind of goes. Um, and yeah, there's that constant self-talk. This, um, this book has multiple narrators. So there's definitely like one or two of the narrators that has that self-talk. And I think that that is actually the one who is narrating this section of, at the very beginning. Um, so it is interesting that, that was, that's pointed out. Um, but here's the, um, the summary of the book. Um, when Stella, a young Métis mother, looks out her window one evening and spots someone in trouble on the break, and the break is a barren field on an isolated strip of land outside her house. She calls the police to alert them to a possible crime. In a series of shifting narratives, people who are connected both directly and indirectly to the victim, uh, police, family, and friends tell their personal, oh, I need to click read more, their personal stories leading up to that fateful night. Um, so, they're definitely in this piece. Um, one thing that uh, particularly stick, stick, that stuck out to me from multiple like readings over of this passage, especially, is um, this sense of the wires feeling close, the low buzz that some people can ignore and some people can hear it but get used to it. I think at the same time with the context of this piece, um, it, uh, and and the uh, subject matter as well, there's a lot of commentary about. Um, like racism, even in um, smaller acts. Um, and I think that's something we talk about a lot, like as of, as of recent times as well, which is uh, a good thing that we're talking about, but like smaller acts of racism or racism existing in someone's everyday life. And in a way that's like racism is something that people who aren't affected by it can easily ignore like white noise. But then at the same time, people who are affected by it they can't ignore it, but they can get used to it, like that last line suggests. They can, unfortunately, like they they deal with it. So, uh, I think that that also speaks a lot to the some of the main themes of the story. Which, um, if you do end up reading this book, which it's a very great book, it it does. Um, I'll give it a trigger warning. It deals with a lot of sensitive topics and and sexual assault. So, um, read it at with with the risk in mind of uh, the context, but. Um, yeah, and the starting here, I think, whereas um, with our previous example of starting with the child and starting with the question of where are they, um, or with Poe starting with the, the immediacy of the narrative and starting with the like, I'm going to tell you a story kind of um, aspect, this narrative starts without a clear idea of who that protagonist is. Um, this voice is like, um, I think I think this part of the right at the beginning starts labeled as Stella as the narrator of this section, but we don't know really like anything about them yet. We don't quite know what this happening was. Um, we just get this description of the break of this space that becomes the site of the um, of the uh, incident, but also it is like a metaphorical space as well within the entirety of the novel. Um, so yeah, that, that's a bit on the break. Um, does anyone have any other thoughts then? I kind of rambled a little bit, but any other thoughts on this passage, um, especially now that you have a little bit more context of the, the story too? Oh, and thank you, Teresa, for posting. Uh, Vermette's new book is called The Strangers. That That's right, yeah. It looks very, very good. And the, the cover is also beautiful. And it's one I'll have, I have on my list to, to pick up soon because um, I, I really enjoyed the break. Um, let's see. Oh, there is a, um, an, a comment saying, white noise is, is a specific word choice to set the theme of racism. Yeah, definitely that. 
that white noise, the choice that she uses to say it's like white noise. Um, we already get that, that um, we, we learn in a way, the sense that we'll be, the way in which we'll be looking at racism. Yeah. Um, another person commented in the middle of the ING sentences, we find a short one, you can ignore it. Yeah, it's, and uh, the comment further says, this stands out a bit as a challenge. What is the reader going to do with this? Yeah. Oh, within the, in the middle of the long sentences. Right, that makes, that makes more sense, sorry. Um, uh, so yeah, we get like a lot of really long sentences here. Yeah, we have in the winter, the break is, and then there's another comma and then a feel, and we get all of that long sentence there. And then we get another long sentence another one broken up by commas and then that is the, the that shortest sentence in this paragraph you can ignore it and that that is kind of yeah like like what the comment commenter says it's, it's a challenge almost to the reader at the beginning of the narrative will you ignore like the messages and major themes of this book like what will you do with it now yeah excellent It's always fun to talk about these things because also people will, will bring up things that I didn't even notice and and you're all already like really picking up on this this quite well so I, I'm glad <laughs> it's, it's quite fun to pick things apart in a way and think about why the reader or why the writer chose to do things in this way but with that I will here's the those um Oh, these are the two books that I mainly cited, the Michael Cardos, The Art and Craft of Fiction, um, Fa Francine Prose's Reading Like a Writer, which uh, Teresa posted both of those in the chat for those of you that are listening here, or I'm sure it'll be linked in like the YouTube video um, for those of you watching. Um, and then that last one also was just a, it's, it's a creative writer's notebook. So it's one of those books where it's like gives you kind of prompts and ideas for what to write about. Um, and it was one that was particularly fun for me during um, like that, that little first bit of COVID. And I still turn back to it every once in a while because it um, not only gives you prompts and ideas, but also breaks down um, writing related, uh, like it breaks down how authors have different styles and use different effects to their advantage um, so but yeah the, the that one is one that you would write in so the library doesn't necessarily have that one but if you can even like find it at a bookstore and like take a picture of some of the the pages it, they're quite fun to try out um, but yeah there's kind of my full citations and now i'll just open it up to um if anyone has anything they would like to ask or get further clarification on or um, talk more about, uh, now is the time. Thank you all.